Hi everyone. So in the last lecture, we talked about angular momentum and we did everything from the perspective of operators and their uh, commutation relationships. In this video, we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to look at the relativistic corrections to atomic spectra, which come down to spin orbit coupling and this will give us a way of remembering uh, Klebsch-Gorn coefficients and we'll uh, look towards understanding the LS and JJ coupling schemes. And I guess the thing that to remember about this is it seems kind of arbitrary as we go through it, but we'll see it when we get to the Dirac equation that a lot of what we do comes naturally uh, out of the Dirac equation. So let's get started. Uh, last year, we learned how to couple angular momenta together. So the klebsch gordon coefficient summarizes the story for us. Um, if we have uh, j equals j1 plus j2, then we write jm, that's the eigenstate, is the sum over uh, m1 and m2, where m1 plus m2 equals big M, um, of c, jm, j1, m1, j2, m2, and j1, m1, j2, m2. So, this is an expansion of the uh, of the eigenstate J M in terms of the basis eigenfunctions J one M one and J two M two. So uh, we've got the basis states here, and we can express this guy in terms of that basis states. So this gives us a useful uh, connection. Uh, we can also go in the other direction, and express j1 m1 j2 m2 in terms of i can say j m like that so oh again we need to remember that the magnetic quantum numbers have to add up okay so um we also learned how to uh, learn how to calculate or generate the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. Uh, using ladder operators if you don't remember that you basically start in the stretch state which is easy to write down and then you apply L minus to get to the one that you want or J minus um, so we learned how to do that uh, but I think it was a fairly unanimous agreement uh, that it was more fun not to do that but to use tables or computers Mathematica. Okay, so that's the story so far. Now we're going to apply all this to atoms today. You can do it with nuclear as well, but then it'll be extra work. So, um, a reminder, a bit of a reminder from Oleg's part of the course, and that is 
that the non-relativistic Hamiltonian uh, for a, a many electron atom or ion is H equals sum over all of the electrons and for each one of them you've got a momentum squared over 2m a kinetic energy and a central potential which is the nucleus um, plus so that's plus a sum for every pair of electrons e squared over ri minus rj like that um so that's the the non-relativistic hamiltonian and uh we approximate We can't actually do that directly. So we approximate it by H equals H naught plus V, uh, where H naught is just a single particle approximation. With some potential, nice simple potential that we can actually calculate, like Hartree Fock, which is not simple at all, but anyway. And a correction, which is uh, the potential. Oh, I should put in the z e squared over r i here as well. But the point is that's all single particle. Um, and the correction is some over all pairs of E squared over Ri minus Rj, the vectory, um, minus this po approximate potential that we had. And um, uh, Ole called you the V effective. So you of R is sometimes a in the notes from the early part of the course as V effective or V effective potential. Good. Um, this effective potential, uh, because it's not just the ZE squared over RI, um, it lifts the degeneracy of the different Ls for uh, the same N in the Coulomb potential. So you know in the, in the normal Coulomb potential, the uh, 3S and the 3P and 3G all have the uh, same energy. But um, in this case, uh, the potential U lifts the degeneracy for a different or the degeneracy of I don't know different L's for same in principal quantum number uh, in the Coulomb potential. So that's was more or less the story so far. Um, and 
we should also remember, so this is, so, so what am I talking about? I mean, that the U of R, which actually, let me just draw that. You know what? I'm actually going to just go back there. So for the, this will be consistent in the final lecture notes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this potential. It's this one minus. So what's what do I want? I want a z e squared over r. So I've got a minus z e squared over r. It doesn't matter where it goes in as long as it goes in somewhere, right? And then I'll take that into account here. So that is the effective potential, which includes the nuclear potential. And then when I remove it, then I need to put back in the nuclear potential. Anyway, as long as I'm consistent. Uh, so U of R looks like, it's gonna look like minus Z E squared over R down here. It's going to look like minus e squared on r over here. And in between, it will do a little bit of wiggling around like that due to the different shells of electrons. Um, and we should also just remember, doing a lot of remembering also, that even the spin independent energies, i.e. the energy spectrum of the spin. Um, oh, what am I doing? So remember also that the e even blur, that the spin independent coulomb potential uh, which is shown here uh, still leads to spin dependent energies so the spectrum is still spin dependent and that is due to exchange interaction you can check that in Oleg's notes if you've forgotten For electrons, we have Fermi statistics. Okay. And we should also, before we finish, just for completeness, in the uh, hydrogen-like non-relativistic limit. One that we've been talking about. Then we have E and L is equal to MC squared Z alpha squared over 2N squared, where alpha is the fine structure constant, E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught H bar C, which is something close to 1 over 137. 0.036 dot, dot, dot. Um, right. So, because of this, um, we can say, well, how fast are the electrons moving? All right, so we'll use Virial Theorem. And in the Virial Theorem for the Coulomb potential, 
the potential energy and the kinetic energy are related like so. So this is the quantum version because expectation value in the classical version is just exact, right? So kinetic energy uh, is half of potential energy and kinetic energy is minus the energy, the, bi the binding energy. So, um, but this is the quantum version. So the kinetic energy is equal to a uh, half mv squared for small values of v, obviously. And so because... Um, we know what the energy is. It's a, written up there. Um, we know that the kinetic energy is equal to, uh, is like minus the, the energy. And so its magnitude, if you like, is um, a half, oh, there should be a minus sign here as well. Good Lord. Uh, minus, uh, so it becomes plus minus mc squared. That's the mass of the electron. And uh, z alpha squared. So basically that's just showing us that um, that the kinetic energy uh, is equal to the uh, minus the, the binding energy. And so if we compare these two e equations, we then can see that V over C has magnitude of like Z alpha. Now I know it's exact for the for the case of the um, hydrogen atom, if we if we assume kinetic energy goes half mv squared, but just to give us an order of magnitude, even in um, many electron atoms. Um, so what that means is that higher order terms um, in V over C, which is like Z alpha, provide relativistic corrections. So it's like in hydrogen, Z equals one and alpha equals one thirty seven. So Z alpha is like very small, one percent. But if Z is like uranium 92, Z is 92 over 137 is not such a small number. So the relativistic corrections are incredibly important. So where do these relativistic corrections, corrections come from? Um, they come from and we're going to take each of these in turn. Relativistic corrections to kinetic energy they come from spin orbit coupling and the so called Darwin term So let's take each of these in turn. So let's go to a new page. So we'll start with the relativistic corrections to kinetic energy. So here, the relativistic form E equals the square root of P squared C squared plus m squared c to the 4, if you remember your classical mechanics and special relativity course, which you can factor out the m, uh, that uh, c squared, the m c squared, m squared c squared. So that's taking out m squared c to the 4th. So I'm left with uh, 1 over m squared c to the 4th times c squared. So as you can see, that ends up with this. Then I expand 
that square root as a small approximation. So that's one plus, uh, and if you, if you can't remember this one, you have to remember this one. Where, where have I changed colors here? All right, just to remind us in blue that square root of one plus x is like one plus a half x squared minus one eight. Sorry, that should be half x. x squared plus dot dot dot. Silly me. Um, so one plus p squared over two uh, m squared c squared minus one eighth of p squared over m squared c squared or squared plus dot 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 which equals m c squared just expanding this out plus p squared over 2m oh look there's a familiar one minus p to the 4 over 8m cubed c squared so this is the first correction, H1. Um, that's the worst one I've ever seen. Uh, so, what's the scale of this for, uh, of this Ham uh, of this term in the, of the Hamiltonian rather? So, the scale, how how we kind of fix it, um, the expectation value of H1 over the expectation value of h naught right, is something like, uh, so the first one goes as p squared over 2m, and this one's going as p to the 4 over 8m cubed c squared. So I divide this one, h1, by this one, which is like h naught, and that will give me, it goes as p squared over m squared c squared, which, and P equals MV, so that's equal to V squared over C squared. And I know what V over C is, that's like Z alpha. So this is like Z alpha squared. And so you know that magnitude goes to Z alpha squared. And so the calculation, the full calculation which I'm not going to do, but you can look it up in the textbook. Okay. Actual calculation gives H1 NLM is equal to minus MC squared over 2. That's the mass of the electron. I'm going to stop writing ME because it's no fun at all. Z alpha n to the power of 4 times n over L plus a half minus 3 quarters. It's actually not that hard to do this calculation because you can just use the virial theorem over and over and over again until you get what you want. So this is the first um, relativistic correction and it has uh, the size Z alpha to the power of 4, but that's relative... But that's because the first order, like the zeroth order is Z alpha squared, right? So just to remind us, where is it? First order term, there it is, is Z alpha squared over 2N squared. And so this one's Z alpha to the power of 4. All right. The next correction is spin orbit coupling. And I'm not going to prove this one either because it's hard. But I just want to kind of give you a hand-waving explanation. So the hand-waving is this. As the electron, and it's, I'll explain why it's going to be hand-waving in a second as well, moves through um, the electric... Can't spell electric field of the nucleus. 
In other words, in the corn potential. So in the electric field of the nucleus, which is E equals minus grad V, it's also the other electrons, isn't it? So E equals minus grad V equals minus the derivative with respect to R of V in the R direction, because it's the central field. Um, it experiences a magnetic field in its rest frame. Right, and the magnetic field is, um, again, so I'm not going to work it out in detail, but just to get a sense of what it is. So, um, like in, uh, I mean, it's mu naught, epsilon naught, and all that stuff. 1 over c squared velocity cross electric field, yeah? And this field... This magnetic field uh, couples with the spin magnetic moment. So it's got a spin magnetic moment. Um, and then, you know, like a minus mu dot B, right? Um, so it's like H2 is something like minus mu to the spin dot this, you know, this induced B field due to the frame shift. All right. And then it's like, that's not enough. Like that was it. You could like then go, oh yeah, that's cool. I'm, 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 I'm pretty comfortable with that. But it turns out then you go a factor of two wrong and that's because of another relativistic effect, which is um, uh, Thomas precession. It's like a, another relativistic shift, which is really... And so because of that one, which nobody ever bothers to explain, they just go, oh, and then there's this other thing, which gives us another factor of a half. So it's like, you know what? Actually, let's skip it entirely, particularly because the Dirac equation will give us all of this for free. And that's coming up. So although historically smart people had to do it, eventually even smarter people came along and worked out how to do it even easier. So you end up with something that looks like this. It's an L dot S term. Um, and actually, we already learned how to do this um, in that we know how to take the expectation value of L dot S. And the result in the L, S, J basis. So take a basis where L, S, and J are all simultaneously um, specified. H2, so now we've got principal quantum number, L, J, M, equals, it ends up being plus or minus, I'll explain that in one second, one quarter MEC squared, 
z alpha over n to the power of 4, n over j plus a half, and 1 over l plus a half. And the plus and minus are for l equals, uh, sorry, j equals l plus or minus a half, respectively. So let me just... Fix that one because it spins up j equals l plus or minus one half respectively okay so two things if you just scroll back up a bit we can see the similarity with um the between this one h2 and the expectation value h1 uh, they both have z alpha over n to the power of four um this one over l plus a half factor is in both and there's an extra factor of two outside, but basically it's looking really, really similar. All right, third, the Darwin term. This one, if you thought the last one was hand wavy, you wait, you just wait for this one. This one arises from this is this is this is the word the Germans got there first the Zitterbewegung of electron Zitterbewegung just means dithering Also, sometimes, like, um, oh, spreads. So, it, some people call it the jittering of the electron. Um, so that if we're lucky, we'll get there in this course. If not, then you'll get it in quantum field theory. Um, it comes from particle antiparticle creation, effectively. Higher order stuff. What does it look like? Well, the Hamiltonian H3 looks something like this H bar squared over 8m squared c squared times grad squared v, be effective there. Um, but I can actually write that as h bar squared over 8m squared c squared e times the charge of the nucleus over epsilon naught. Uh, and the point is that this uh, grad squared v uh, only has its presence felt at the nucleus. So you end up with 2m squared c squared, z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught uh, times the three dimensional Dirac delta function. So it's a uh, localized. This is a localized potential um, at the origin. Um, and therefore, it only really affects electrons with L equal to zero because they're the only ones that can penetrate the centripetal barrier and actually get to the nucleus. If you've got a centrifugal barrier, centripetal barrier, um, then it stops it from going in. So that's because of centripetal, I can never remember which one, centripetal, centrifugal, because it's a centrifugal force barrier 
All right. Um, and what's the size of that one? Well, H3 and J equals uh, a half, L equals zero, right? So it only applies to that L equals zero one. It's equal to pi h bar squared over 2m squared c squared z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times the wave function at the origin squared. And that is equal to a half m c squared. Oh my god, it's happening again. Good lord. So, putting all of that together, if we take H1 and H2 and H3 and add them together, we will get a final delta shift, del sorry, energy shift, delta E is equal to a half MC squared, Z alpha over N to the power of four, and then you sum up and you'll get three quarters minus N over J plus one half. So it doesn't depend on L, it only depends on J. So we will return to this later. For the moment, let's just think about how uh, these, this will affect the spectrum in hydrogen. So in hydrogen, oops, in hydrogen, we've got the non-relativistic spectrum. That's my perfectly straight line. You got n equals one, n equals two, n equals 3, and so on. That's your Rydberg series. That's Bohr theory, right? Good old Bohr. And now we add relativity, and what happens is we have a splitting. Well, 1s, 1 1 half doesn't split. So this is plus relativity. This is adding those three terms that we just talked about. Um, but at n equals 2, that's 2s and 2p, right? These guys get split like this so that you've got the 2s one half and the 2p one half are here and the 2p three half is here because, again, it only depends on j, this formula. It doesn't depend on l. So 2s one half and 2p one half are still degenerate. And then you've got the n equals 3. And just to remind us again, one more time, it's important, is that I just said that the 2s1 half and 2p1 half are degenerate. That's only for hydrogen, right? Once we have another electron, then we have an effective potential. So that will split the Ls. But this is for just the pure Coulomb. Um, so for pure Coulomb, now we've got 3s one half and 3p one half hanging out together. We've got 3p three half and 3d three half hanging out together and 3d five half over here. And then it turns out that actually these two here, these will be split even for hydrogen by something called the Lamb shift. And this was one of the first hints for quantum electrodynamics. So our next job is to understand how uh, these, the coupling schemes for many electron atoms work. Uh, with the spin orbit potential.
So when we have many electrons, we have to sum up the angular momentum somehow. And the point is that there are different ways of doing this. But the Hamiltonian is H equals H naught, that's the central field, plus J E squared over R I J minus sum over I of Oh, that should probably be really want that one. It's the same for all the electrons, usually. U R R I and put the nucleus back in for consistency with what we did before. Right. And then for each electron, I should also have some potential and li dot si. Right. So no, colors, colors, green, beautiful. This one here, that's the central field Hamiltonian. Uh, this stuff here, all of this, let me just call that uh, H1. Even though I used H1 just a minute ago for a completely different context. But anyway, we'll call it the residual Ah. residual Coulomb interaction and this one we will call hmm how about H2 the spin orbit interaction. Okay, in light atoms, and near neutral ions, light ones, um, then H1 is tends to be much, much bigger than H2. In other words, the residual column interaction is more important. So uh, that means we can treat H2 as a perturbation, H2 as a... H2 is a perturbation. And then we're going to get uh, Huynh's rules. And we're going to do that because we don't worry about J. We're just going to do the, you know, we're going to do LS coupling. LS coupling. Okay. So... Should we go into detail about that one now? Um, sure. Um, let's do an example. So we'll talk about carbon. It's 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p squared. So these ones uh, closed shells and closed shells have L equals zero, S equals zero, and therefore J equals L plus, L plus S equals zero as well. 
right? So in other words, all I have to worry about is the valence um, the valence uh, electrons, the 2p squared. They're going to carry all of the angular momenta. Right. So let's see how we go. Uh, so 2p squared, we're going to do LS coupling. So 2p squared can have S equals a half plus a half, right? Sum of the two spins. And that means that we can have either zero or one for the spin. Um, great. L equals one plus one. So that can be zero, one, or two. Great. And then we can stop, right? But actually, so that's LS coupling. And so then we ask ourselves, well, which ones are we allowed to have here? The thing is that the wave function for the elect, um, for carbon has got to be an anti has got to be anti symmetrized, right? Because it's got to be anti symmetrized. We have um, for the if we have an a so if we have um, spin equals one, that means that the that the electrons both have spin in the same direction. So that's a symmetrized um, wave function. And so in order to have an anti-symmetric total wave function, it means that the orbital part has to be anti-symmetric. And so that means we can only have L equals one if we have, sorry, you can only have S equals one if we have L equals one. Right, so that's because the total wave function, right, and the wave function is a is the radial part. So remember this. So, so we have psi, which is for each electron. We have wave. It's p of r on r, some y l m times some spin wave function. Right, and then you've got um, the total wave function has to be anti symmetrized version. So one R one, so one R two, slated determinant. Right, so that's the point. If um, the spin part is symmetric, then the YLM has to be anti-symmetric uh, and vice versa because the whole thing has to be anti-symmetric. And so for that reason, if we have S equals zero, then we can have, so that's an anti-symmetrized, then we can have L equals zero or two, i.e. symmetric. Um, so this one, uh, once we have L, S equals 1 and L equals 1, that means that we have options for J equals L plus S equals, so that's a little aside there, just take that out later. Um, J equals L plus S equals um, uh, 1 plus one, this is for the first case there. Don't like how this is going. Equals zero, one, or two. And for the second case, This is case, and then for this, for, for the other case, so this one, ah, new color. I'm gonna go back. Uh, 
and I'll call this one A and B. And this is A and this is B. So in the second one we have J equals uh, zero plus zero. So that's obviously just gonna be zero. Or we have J equals zero plus two. And that's obviously two. So this one here is um, S equals one. So it's triplet, L equals one, P, zero, one, or two. This one here is, it's a singlet, it's S wave and J equals zero. And this one is, it's a singlet, it's D wave and J equals two. So that's all the states that we have. So just to recap, for LS coupling, we take L equals L1 plus L2 plus dot, 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 dot. S equals S1 plus S2, and you add them all quantum mechanically, right? So these are all vector E, you add them all quantum mechanically, you make sure you keep all your symmetry rules correct, and then you just sum up L plus S to get your J's. Cool, so that's LS coupling, just with an example. Um, for JJ coupling, well, let's not go to that first. Okay, so first we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Uh, so what about, okay, what about this? So what about if it's carbon, another example, carbon, again, but we'll have 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p, 3p. Now, these aren't identical electrons in the excited state. These two valence electrons are not identical. These are not identical. They still have to be anti-symmetrized, but now they're, n n but we can always anti-symmetrize it. So we can, can always, regardless of the spin and the angular momentum, can always anti-symmetrize and so no restrictions so we can have um, again we can have s equals 0 or 1 we can have l equals 0 1 or 2 and then we can have any combination J equals L plus S that we like. So this gives us many options. So we'll have, for example, triplet D, one, two, three. We'll have triplet P, not one, two, had that one before. We have triplet S, one. That's just, so this is not all one or two. That point is that you split first. Singlet D, two. Single P1, that's a new one. Single S0. So a lot of options there. So that's um, LS. And then LS is also good. So LS coupling also helps us understand uh, Huns rules. Leads to Huns rules. And Huns rules basically say you maximize S, which makes the spin wave function as symmetric as possible. Why would I want to make the, the spin wave function symmetric as possible? Because then I can make the spatial wave function um, more anti-symmetric. And then this will reduce the Coulomb 
propulsion. It's a bit hand wavy, but that's pretty much how it's explained. Uh, then, then you want to maximize L. Because that keeps the electrons as apart as possible. So first you maximize the S and then you maximize the L. And then couple L plus S to get J. And if the subshell is less than half full, this is going to the nitty gritty of Hundrul here. We have the smallest, smallest J has lowest energy. Or if the subshell is more than half full, larger J has lowest energy. All right. Okay, so that's enough one rule, I reckon. Um, one other point is that that LS coupling also helps us understand the quantum mechanical selection rules for light. Remember the selection rules. These were like, and that's because photons couple to L, right? So it's, they don't couple to, to so photons couple to the orbital angular momentum L and spin flips. So they're going from like singlet to triplet um, are suppressed. And the rule, the approximate rule, is that you know the change in angular momentum should be less than or equal to one. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. What about JJ coupling? When am I going to use JJ coupling? So. I'm going to use JJ coupling when I've got uh, heavy atoms or high, oops, highly ionized atoms. I guess they're highly ionized ions. So, heavy, what does heavy mean? Increase edge. So, increase Z. Then, so we think of the same one, right? So, we think of carbon-like carbon, carbon -like again. One S squared, two S squared, two P squared. Same as before. So, think of the carbon light, but with a larger Z now. Right, so we keep the same. So this is called an isoelectronic sequence. You keep the number of electrons the same. You increase Z, and then um, 
each 2p electron has L equals 1 and S equal 1 half. And therefore, the, they can couple to get J equals 1 half or 3 half. Um, so this gives us a few options. So firstly, we've got option um, J1 equals J2 equals one half. Um, now we need to be careful because although we could then say big J equals J1 plus J2 is either going to be equal to naught or one. But because they're now in exactly the same state, I can't have them being uh, symmetric here. I have to have them anti-symmetric. So the only J equals zero is anti-symmetric. I'm not allowed to have this one. So um, only have J equals zero, right? So in other words, because it's going to be 2P one half, 2P one half, I can only have 2P one half squared if they're pointing in opposite directions. Just like when you have like S waves, you can have one S up and one S down, but you can't have one S adding together to get total uh, spin one. Okay, second one is we could have J equals three half. J1, J2 equal 3 half. And now we have big J is going to be equal to 0, 1, 2, or 3. But again, we're not allowed to have J equals 1, and we're not allowed to have J equals 3. So only allowed to have J equals 0 or 2. Only anti-symmetric. Only anti-symmetric is allowed. And finally, we'll have one of them, doesn't matter which, is equal to one half, and J2 equals three half. And then we can have J equals one or two. And now there's no restrictions because they're distinguishable particles. And the way that we talk about these ones, the first one, we would write it as one half, one half, zero. The second one was write as three half, three half, oops, and that's either um, zero or two. And the last one will be one half, three half, and that one we're going to write uh, can be one or two. And just to count, right? Like so, so it seems like you know how can I couple it in a different way? But but just check this out. If I Start counting how many of each one of these is available. Oh, come on. I don't like that color. If we count that one, so then how many of these type uh how many of these ones are there? How many how many states does this represent? Well, j equals zero, the total j equals zero. So the only, it only has one state, m equals zero. So the degeneracy of this state is one. That's what that g means. Um, what about this one here? What's the degeneracy of this state? Well, we've got one of them has j equals zero. So that has a degeneracy of one. Um, and the other one has a degeneracy of five because it's j equals two. So the one with j equals two can have minus two, minus, m equals minus two, minus one, zero, one, or two. So five different states. And then finally, this one has a degeneracy of three and a degeneracy of five. So the total number of states is 1 plus 1 plus 5 plus 3 plus 5 equals 15. Mm. How does that compare? Let's just go back a little bit up here and we'll go back to our 1s. Where is it? Here we go. Here's our options. So we've got the triplet P 
0, 1, and 2. So triplet P, 0, 1, and 2 has G equal uh, 1 for J equals 0, uh, 3 for J equals 1, and 5 for J equals 2. We've got single S, 0, which has G equals 1, only one state. And 1, D, 2, G equals 5. And if I sum up all of these, is 15, as I expect. Because uh, this is just the basis. It doesn't matter in the end of the day whether you go by LS or JJ. It's just a matter of convenience. In the light elements, it's more convenient to go with LS coupling. In the heavy ones, it's more convenient to go with JJ coupling. And in fact, you can sort of make a nice little diagram where you will grow energies. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to add it in, but I'll explain it anyway on the way. Maybe I can add it in here. Oh, I don't know how. Okay, energies um, divided by Z cubed. You'll see why when you see the proper case. So you've got the, the triplet P012. That's the smallest according to our um, Hund's rules. Right, the next one, according to the Hund's rules, is going to be um, uh, singlet D2, and the next one's going to be singlet S0. So, remember, according to the Hund's rule, you start with maximizing S, then you maximize L, and then you couple L and S. So, how does this work? You've got these ones, and then what happens? At the high Z limit, you've got one half, one half, zero. So that one's going to get there somehow as you increase Zs. Um, and then you're going to have your cases with uh, one half, three half. And how many are there? There's three plus five. Where do they come from? They come from here and here. That's where they go. And then you've got your three half, three half. And that can couple to give naught or two. And where do they come from? One from there. And one's from there. And so you see those come together in energies. And I will add that picture uh, that's calculated using um, uh, atomic structure codes. My own atomic structure codes, as it turns out. Um, and you'll be able to see how that works in the real case of um, carbon-like atoms. So I'm going to basically do the picture I've just shown you, but um, you know, using a real calculation. Okay, that'll do for today. Uh, next week we'll get on to, oh, sorry, next lesson we'll get on to relativistic quantum mechanics and the Klein-Gordon equation. Have a good one.